Hey everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know when the heck you're watching this, but if you're watching it uh, live, as this debuts right now on Facebook or YouTube, we want to uh, say hello and welcome you to our uh, live, I guess, online gathering of the Pathways Church community. And my name is Nick, and uh, wow, it has been a very warm week in the Pacific Northwest. Now, I know there's some of you who participate in this online thing who don't live in the Northwest, and you're saying, come on, guys, settle down. It's been hot everywhere this summer. It's your turn, finally. And yes, it has been our turn. We've been pretty warm uh, in the 90s all week long, and that is pretty hot here. We're not used to that kind of weather. So hopefully... Now, those of you in the area are staying cool somehow. Maybe you found a little air conditioning unit or you've been uh, just uh, pouring ice all over yourself, whatever you've needed to do to stay cool. Uh, hopefully, this has been a good week for you and uh, we're almost through the heat wave. So, uh, hopefully, uh, here this morning, then we'll have a chance to kind of spend some time here together. I uh, want to give you just a couple heads up about things that are going on. First of all, here in a moment, we are going to be doing some singing. Billy, our worship leader, is going to lead us in a time of singing. Uh, he's got two songs here, like we kind of normally do in our online experience, and sandwiched in between is kind of a reading of Psalm 107, a little reflective video, and uh, he's this all is aimed to kind of jumpstart us right into uh, the awareness of God's presence with us, and part of what it means to worship is just having an awareness that God is actually here with us in the room, and uh, so we want to uh, kind of uh, ease ourselves into that and uh, hopefully through the music here and maybe that video it will ease us into that time. Then uh, I'm going to come back on here in a little bit and uh, uh, we're going to continue our series on the Bible. We have a few left. We're talking about the character of God. What type of God would create a Bible as flawed as our Bible is? And that's what we're going to be kind of starting in on today. We've got a couple messages here just to kind of tie a bow on this whole thing that will give us kind of a basis for uh, really dealing with a Bible that is very human and understanding how it can still be hugely influential, authoritative, and beneficial in our spiritual lives. So I'll come back, I'll share a little bit on that, and then we're going to do communion at the end. And communion, uh, really in our in-person thing, we supply the necessary things you need for communion, uh, but online you'll have to do a little bit of your own work here. So if you want to get up now or here in a moment and find some uh, crackers or some bread, and maybe some juice, um, some juice you got in the fridge, or maybe some leftover wine from last night. Uh, you can pull that out. You just need some bread and you need a cup. And uh, there are two symbols. Jesus, uh, there's symbols Jesus left for us because uh, he knew we needed kind of physical, tactile things, right? And he said to take these things in remembrance of his death, his burial, his resurrection. And so we do that each week, and we'd love for you to participate with us uh, at the end of our time here today. And then we'll we'll have some announcements uh, to close us out. Okay. Uh, that's pretty much it. Normally, I give us a, a little spiel here on uh, who we are as the church community, right? Uh, and you've probably heard it a thousand times if you've been a part of this uh, online experience, and that is that we're cautious and we're curious. Uh, we're a group of people that are sort of cautious about organized religion. Uh, we've seen it used in some good ways, but we've also used, seen it used in some really dangerous ways. And so we find ourselves a little cautious, uh, but that sort of also makes us curious because uh, many of us are interested in the person of Jesus. Actually, many of us have made a commitment to follow Jesus with our whole life, uh, but it hasn't answered every question. We still have tons of questions, and so we know there's a lot of church experiences where you can, uh, it's said that you can ask questions, but usually there's a bunch of things that really it's better if you don't. <laughs> and many of us have gotten in trouble uh, uh, because we've wanted to ask those questions. And we think, actually, religious experiences are best when we're free to ask questions because God certainly isn't threatened by our questions, and we shouldn't be either. So we want to be a community that's always questioning things because it's questioning things that actually leads us to uh, deeper discoveries of faith or recommitments of faith or whatever else. So we want to always be questioning, reassessing, and keeping ourselves open to where God is leading us. So if any of those two things uh, kind of fit with you, then this might be a really good uh, community for you. Okay, that's pretty much it here. Uh, let's get into the music and the video stuff, and then I'll come back and join you here in just a few moments, and we'll pick up our series again, okay? All right, Billy, take it away.
my heart is so overwhelmed And I cannot hear your voice I'll hold on to what is true Though I cannot see If the storms of life they come And the road ahead gets steep I will lift these hands in faith I will believe I'll remind myself of all that you've done And the life I have because of your son Cause love came down and rescued me Love came down and set me free And I am yours Promise comes my way when I feel your hands of grace rest upon me. Staying desperate for you, God, staying humble at your feet. I will lift these hands in praise. I will believe, I'll remind myself of all that you've done. And the life I have because of your son. Cause love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. And I am yours. down and set me free I am yours I am forever yours mountain high you valley low I'll sing out remind my soul that I am yours I am forever yours cause love came down and rescued me love came down
Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come
your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my call It's so crazy that God would not spare God's self the indignity of something like hiccups <laughs> or having a pancreas, right? I mean, there's like this fact that God became flesh, like this stuff, the stuff that disappoints us all the time, you know, that sort of gets in the way and um, isn't like we think it should be and ages and... Um, gets fat and stops producing insulin, right? I mean, the, the ways in which our physical bodies can so um, fumble and disappoint us. And, and yet, this is what God chose to have. That's incredible to me. And I, what does that then mean that we have a human body, that this is, this is the God chose to make God's home within flesh? What does that mean for the fact that I have a human body? And then what does that mean for how much concern I might have for how any human body is treated or trafficked or abused, right? So this, this means something profound to humanity that God chose to walk among us in flesh. That is powerful to me. Wow, I like that. Thanks to uh, Nadia Weber Boltz for sharing that with us there, talking about incarnation. It is incredible that God would become a human because humans are bizarre, crazy, frail, weak, faulty, full of problems. And it's crazy to think that God would stoop so low as to become one of us. Uh, hey, uh, in the evenings now, uh, we've been eating dinner and uh, then we watch uh, The Office. Sometimes we'll just watch uh, the old Office reruns while we're eating dinner. We've been sitting outside watching The Office and it's just been kind of fun uh, to do that. And you just watch The Office and it's an incredible show because uh, it is so funny, of course. There's lots of humor to it, but it's uh, putting a spotlight on all these human interactions and you just get to see really how screwed up humans are, you know, as you just watch Michael Scott and the interactions with different people and you just see uh, really how frail and problematic human relationships are. And it's crazy to think that God became a human like us. Now, I was thinking of another uh, show, not really a show, actually, it's a movie uh, that uh, I, is just one of my favorites of all time. And I mean, hopefully you've seen it and I'm not spoiling this for you because it is one of the greatest movies of all time and you should have seen it by now. It is Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. And uh, it's the third of the Indiana Jones movies. They made a fourth one, but we try to pretend it doesn't exist because that was a horrible movie. But uh, The Last Crusade was a super fun movie because J or, uh, Indiana Jones uh, is just a really fun character. And um, maybe the most fun scene of the whole thing, you know, the most quoted scene is near the end when they find the Holy Grail. 
and you remember they come across this room and uh, it's got this old knight in there who's been protecting the Holy Grail for uh, eons and eons, apparently. And you go in there, and this room is full of cups and chalices, you remember? And only one of them is the Holy Grail that will grant uh, eternal life if you drink from it. And so uh, Indiana Jones walks in, and he also comes in with uh, the bad guy of the movie, Walter Donovan, kind of a Nazi bad guy who's also trying to find... Uh, the Holy Grail and use it for his purposes and you remember that first up uh, Walter Donovan gets to try to find the right cup and the old knight you remember he tells him that if you find the right one and you drink from it it will give you eternal life but if you don't the opposite will happen and so you remember he tells him choose wisely and so our Nazi bad guy Walter Donovan he searches through the room and he finds the cup that is uh, really the most ornate, uh, the most beautiful, the most expensive looking cup in the room. And you remember he picks it up and he says, now that is the cup of the king of kings. And of course, it looks like a king's cup. I mean, usually only the king would drink out of such an ornate cup. But you remember that it's actually the wrong choice. It is not the right cup. And he drinks from it and he like shrivels up. His face melts. You remember that? I wish I could play this scene for you. Uh, but I'm sure that Facebook and YouTube would ban us for several weeks if I tried to show you a clip of this. But it's an incredible scene where the dude's just face melts off, right? Because he drinks from the wrong cup. And you remember the old knight, he goes, he chose poorly <laughs> it's just a great scene right because he chose the most ornate cup the one that looks like it would belong to the king of kings but of course it's the wrong one and his face melts and so now it's indiana jones's turn and he searches through the room and he sees all of these beautiful ornate cups and he passes over all of them until he finds the most basic boring no frills cup in the room and he says now that is the cup of a carpenter and he takes a drink and he's right this most basic boring cup that does not look anything expensive at all and isn't of course is the holy grail the cup of jesus jesus cup that he drinks out of and it's just this great scene right and it's all about expectations the bad guy our nazi bad guy walter donovan he had the wrong person the picture of what kind of person jesus is he correctly identified him as the king of kings and the lord of lords but he assumed like many of us that the king of kings would want to show that off show off that status show off that power demonstrate his power, have everything flashy, that he would have the nicest goblet of anyone in the room. And yet Indiana Jones realizes that that's not how Jesus thinks and acts. It's all about expectations. And our view of God impacts our expectations about the things that God makes or is doing. The Bible, for instance, what we think God is like, his nature, his character, how he chooses to use his power, what we think about God, our view of God, impacts what we expect the Bible material to be. Now we're doing a series here and we're calling it Construction Zone. This is season one. We're going to do several seasons of Construction Zone, but we're starting uh, with the Bible itself and we're looking at and reassessing our view of some things here, the Bible material itself. And we started with the Bible because of course we're going to be referencing the Bible in all of our other areas of discussion. Uh, we're going to talk about things like violence and war. We're going to talk about things like gender roles and same-sex relationships and uh, even some political stuff. And what we think about the Bible material, what we think it is and how it works, will influence how we use it in those uh, conversations down the road and its relevance to those issues. And so how we view the Bible material, in my mind, is sort of the core issue of the modern church today. If we're going to discuss a lot of these issues out here that we have curiosity about and perhaps need to reassess, we need to sh be sure we have a good handle on what the Bible material is. What are our expectations of Scripture? What is it what is it? What is it doing? How is it authoritative? Now, I want to take us back to that Indiana Jones scene 
and use the Indiana Jones here text as sort of an analogy. Now, let's just say we were in that room with the old knight, okay? We're in there with that old decrepit knight who can barely stand, right? But instead of being in this room with a bunch of goblets and chalices and cups, we're in this room with a bunch of scriptures, Bibles bound together. And we look around the room and we are trying to find the holy grail of Bibles. We're trying to find the one that must be the true Bible. And so as we walk around the room that old night, he points out to us uh, a collection of texts, a Bible that is absolutely perfect. There are no errors. There are no contradictions. There is none of the human messiness with faulty assumptions. There's no imperfect and evolving views of how science and nature works or what God is like. What we have in this particular Bible is a completely consistent and clear book that is dropped from heaven by God with exactly what God wants to say from only his perspective. I mean, it's absolutely perfect. But then he walks us around the room. And on the other end of the table is another Bible, another collection of scriptures. But this one is clearly messy. It doesn't have the shine and the eloquence of the other one. It has all sorts of errors. Some are significant, some most are pretty minor. Uh, there's multiple contradictions in this Bible where alternate tellings of a story all seem preserved as one. And there, this Bible, it's full of long ago disproved views of how nature works, right? And it's full of views of God expressed that clearly show the bias of a primitive understanding of God. And so we look at this Bible and it's completely imperfect. It's just a collection that seems, well, it seems very human and weak. There's nothing perfect about it. Now, as we look at these two options which one would seem to be likely to be the scriptures of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Well, obviously, you know I'm setting you up. But if you didn't, you'd probably be tempted to select a scripture that looks a lot like the cup that our Nazi bad guy chose in Indiana Jones. You'd opt for the perfect text because you'd think a perfect God deserved a perfect text text. But if you selected that one, I think you'd be wrong. Although I do hope that your face wouldn't melt off like the guy in the actual movie does. See, what we're talking about here is what the Bible actually is. And when we talk about what the Bible actually is, and if we begin to acknowledge that what we actually have, not what we wish that we had, but what we actually have is a human, flawed, messy collection of documents. And we've seen that as we've gone through this series, right? But when we begin to acknowledge that, often it can feel nerve wracking because in that moment, we're sort of deconstructing a way of thinking about the Bible that we've become used to. And it seems like this old way of thinking actually elevates God to the highest possible level and his scripture along with it. But what if we've got the wrong expectation of the Bible because we have the wrong picture of what God is like. I mean, what kind of God would inspire not a perfect text handed down from the clouds with only God's viewpoint expressed in it? What kind of God would inspire a weak, errant at times, error-prone, mistaken human Bible text? I mean, what kind of God would work through that messy of a communication process? And that's the big question, isn't it? What kind of God would risk working with humans in such a messy and imprecise way, stooping so low as to breathe scripture through flawed and weak messengers of humanity? It seems like only a weak and foolish God would do that. And that, of course, is what it appears that we have in Jesus. Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But Jesus is the weak and foolish King. At least he appears so from the outside. Let's look at the life of Jesus here. 
I mean, things about him that just seem weak and foolish. Uh, first of all, uh, Jesus, instead of seizing the top, he always seems to move to the bottom. Now, the incarnation of Jesus, God becoming a human, is so illuminating of an insight into the type of God that Yahweh actually is. He's an all-powerful God with all the resources you could ever have, with all the wealth, with all the power, with all the comforts that it means to be divine. And yet we discover that in becoming human, he gives up all the privileges of what it means to be God. He is absolutely on top, but he isn't concerned with staying on top or climbing to a higher top like you and I might be. He makes the stunning decision instead to go to the bottom. That's what Paul tells us in Philippians 2, verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness. I mean, here is a God becoming human, emptying himself of all the advantages of being God. And that's just crazy, right? What kind of God would do this? Who would give up his privileged position and become something that is lesser, uh, that would take on a body that is flawed and broken and gets sick and gets injured. I mean, what kind of God does this? What kind of God gives up being a God to become a weak human? But it isn't just that Jesus gives up his divine privileges. He also gives up all the human privileges that royalty usually enjoy. I mean, he is the king of kings. But instead of being born to a royal family, well, he's born to an unwed mother under some sort of scandalous appearing circumstances. Instead of being born in a palace, he's born in a dirty stable and laid to rest in an animal eating trough. Instead of being dressed in royal garments, well, when he enters the world, he's swaddled in just rags. And his arrival, it's not heralded by all the royal channels going out everywhere. He's simply visited by lowly shepherds and pagan astrologers. And this is not someone born into safety. Instead of finding safety in the protection of a royal house, being born into something like that, he actually must become a refugee fleeing shelter in Egypt because the king of his land wants him murdered. I mean, this is a God who doesn't just give up his divine rights. He gives up all the human comforts and rights of being someone with power. This is the type of God who created the Bible strange God indeed, who gives up all the advantages, not just of being a God, but also all the advantages of being a powerful human. Because in Jesus, God chose not just to become human, but the lowest of humans. And this seems so foolish to us. It's not what we would do with that kind of power. It's not what anybody we've ever known would do with that kind of power. Greg Boyd, in his excellent little book called Imperfect, uh, Inspired Imperfection, he says this, Kings have always used their superior power to benefit themselves and their loved ones. They've always lived in opulent castles, worn the richest and most ornate clothing, eaten the finest food, and drunk in the finest wine from the biggest, shiniest, and most expensive chalices. Since this is how human kings have always behaved, it is understandable that people would assume that this is also how King Jesus must have behaved. As a matter of fact, this is what the vast majority of people throughout human history have assumed about God or the gods. Since the gods must have the most power, people have assumed that the gods must enjoy the most privileges, possess the most wealth, enjoy the most comfort, and display the most opulent glory. And people have always assumed this because this is what they would do if they were a god. The oddness of the god whom Jesus reveals is evident from the moment he decided to become incarnate. In diametric opposition to the way earthly kings and pagan gods have always used their superior status, Jesus never used any of the advantages he possessed as the Son of God for his own benefit. You see, I love that quote. Boyd is saying here that the arrival of God 
on this planet in human form is like a shockwave of deconstruction and reconstruction, right? Of how people think about God right from the beginning. All of a sudden, the way that God even arrives on this planet, being born the way he is, giving up all of his divine and really human privileges, is causing all of us to deconstruct and think about how we've always thought about what power is and what this God must be like and to reassess it and reconstruct something new. Perhaps we need to reassess some things. But it's not just how Jesus arrives on the scene, but it's how he lives that causes even more questions. Because for this weak and foolish King Jesus, we discover that when he lives his life, instead of courting wealth and power, he embraces instead poverty and the outsider. And it's just the most bizarre thing because Jesus does not live a life that seems anything like we recognize as normal. I mean, all of us, we're trying to climb a ladder of success to get more and to get better and to make relationships with people that can help us along the way. I mean, that is the way the world works. You're just trying to get ahead in life, to stay on top. We're kind of chasing after wealth and power, but that's not what life is like for Jesus. You know, the ministry that Jesus is famous for and fills almost all the pages of the Gospels is about a three-year period in Jesus' life where he roams the countryside as a homeless, itinerant preacher living mostly off the generosity of those around him. And he appears to have no home, no possessions, no income. He isn't trying to climb some corporate ladder or start a nonprofit that will fund him. He just uses the short amount of time he has to give away all that he is to others around him. And about those others, right? I mean, they aren't the wealthy, the elite, the powerful, the ones that he should be lobbying to see if they can come along beside his cause and champion him and get him extra resources to do more miracles and healings and teachings. No, he doesn't spend time with those people so much. Almost all of his time is spent with those who are poor, outsiders, the down and out, the sick, which in Jesus' day were considered cursed. I mean, he doesn't spend time with the wealthy so much. He's spending all of his time with the poor. And he goes around and he says these absolutely upside down things like, the first will be last, and the last will be first. And then he'll say, blessed are the poor, and issue a warning to the rich. He goes around welcoming the people that religion has kicked out and warning the religious insiders that they are the ones most in danger of exclusion. I mean, everything is upside down and backwards with this guy and how he deals with wealth and power. And all of this predictably gets him in trouble because he is absolutely not the picture of God that people expected him to be because their expectations of what God must be like had influenced what they expected of the Christ. And he has turned all of those expectations upside down. But maybe the strangest part of Jesus' life is the way that he chooses to use power. Because instead of using power to secure himself, he uses it to lift up others. Now, now most people in life, they spend all their time trying to gain power so they can use it for their own benefit, but not Jesus. Jesus appears to leverage all the power he has in serving others. It's an interesting story in John uh, 13. The disciples are having their last meal. It's the Last Supper, they call it, right? And he's got them all gathered around, and he's going to go to the cross, but he has one last supper, one last meal with his disciples, and He's got them all gathered together for the final time. And John tells us in this moment that Jesus knew in this moment that all power in the universe was his. John 13 verse 3 says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. All things under his power. Uh, Jesus knows in this moment he is the top dog. Nobody in the universe has more power than him. Some people are going to come and arrest him and try to kill him. 
No problem. He has more power than any of them. He could just crush them. You think you've got all the power in the world. On the night before they're coming after you, you could just completely take them out. You think that's what he must do. After John 13, 3, where he realizes all he has all the power, he must then marshal a campaign to eliminate all of his enemies. But that's not what the next verse says. The next verse in verse 4 says this. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Wow. That's an interesting scene, right? You see, because John wants us to know at this very moment Jesus is absolutely aware that all the power in the universe is his. And what does Jesus do with all that power? Well, he picks up a towel. He fills a bowl full of water. And he begins to wash his disciples' dirty feet. A task that nobody wanted to do. A task that needed to be done. But nobody wanted to wash the dirty, stinky feet of everyone at the table. In fact, you can imagine, knowing a little bit about these disciples, that they'd probably been fighting over who would have to do it. And yet the person at the table, with all the power in the universe, uses that power to wash the disciples' feet. A God who comes to wash dirty feet? A God who should be being worshipped in this moment by these 12 guys. Guys who, by the way, seem to get everything wrong pretty much all the time. And now Jesus realizes that he has all the power in the universe. And he is going to use all the power in the universe to wash their feet? Wow. It's unexpected. You see, Jesus shows us that the greatest form of power in the universe is not a power over others, but a power under others that comes under them and lifts them up. Because you can coerce and force obedience, but that's not true power. True power is love. And love cannot be coerced. It can only be offered and invited. And that is why The cross is the full revelation of God. It's not just that Jesus is the full revelation of God. We've already looked at that in our series here where Hebrews says that Jesus is the exact representation of God, right? He is the full expression of God. But it's not just that Jesus is the full revelation of God. It's actually more specific than that. Jesus on the cross is the full revelation revelation of God because Jesus on the cross is where we see the full expression of this foolishness, this foolish, reckless, weak looking love that appears in Jesus. Because when the ultimate evil needs to be defeated, Jesus does it not by calling out an army or breathing fire, but by allowing himself to be killed. And it looks like foolishness. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are parent or who are perishing. I mean, Paul just says it right out here. He's like, you know what? This whole cross thing, it just looks like absolute weakness, absolute foolishness that you would die and somehow then you would triumph over evil. I mean, it just sounds like absolute foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, It is the power of God. You see, it seems foolish. The cross seems weak. But it is the power of God. In his second letter to Corinthians, Paul writes down a revelation that he had from God about his power. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 90, God has spoken to Paul and Paul shares that word to us. Where God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in what? In weakness. This is an unusual God here. 
upsetting all of our assumptions. He is letting us know that his power is made perfect in weakness. And he is the weak and foolish king, but it turns out that what looks like weakness is actually the power to save us all. And that's why Paul writes in in Colossians 2 verse 15, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. What is it that triumphs over evil? It is the cross. The cross, it looks like weakness. It looks like foolishness, but it isn't. It is power. And by laying down his life, Jesus at the cross defeats sin and death and the evil powers at work in this world. And this is absolutely shocking because God saves here, not with the power of violence and might and strength, but with the power of love and self-sacrifice. God allows people to act against him, which looks weak, but he uses it as the power to defeat evil. It's upside down. It's not what we expected. And this is the type of God that we see in Jesus. That is the God of the Bible. A Bible full of human errors and contradictions and historical inaccuracies at times. Incorrect science, science uh, they wouldn't call it science, but incorrect views of how nature works. Uh, faulty views at times of God himself. A Bible that just seems so weak and foolish, doesn't it? But would we expect anything different from a God like ours? Wouldn't we expect such a foolish Bible from Jesus, a God stooping so low to speak through the messiness of the human voice and condition? You see, it's not a betrayal of God to acknowledge the humanness of the Bible. It is perhaps a betrayal of God to think that he'd breathe scripture in a completely different way than the way the character that we see in Jesus at the cross. It should not be shocking to us that God is willing to get involved with the messiness of humanity and people and allow them to act and move and speak as he is trying to communicate because when the word itself became flesh, it entered into the same dynamic. We're going to talk next week about what it means for God to speak in a way that doesn't override a human's ability to communicate as well, this breathing both the divine breath and the human voice. And we're going to look at how that works uh, next week. We'll talk about that. But I think it's important for us to see right here from the beginning that it should not be shocking that we have a Bible that looks like that old plain cup that Indiana Jones found in the room. You get it? All right, we want to go to the communion table today. Uh, We want to celebrate that we have a God that is willing to step into our human messiness. It's unbelievable. It's incredible that God would stoop so low as to become one of us and then ultimately to allow all the sin that we have sown into the world, right? Harming one another, hurting one another, and those things have collateral damage beyond just the individuals that we hurt or our greed and our selfishness. It has collateral damage and hurting people around us. And Jesus allowed all of that that we've sown into the world to rebound on him and allowed it to put him up on a cross and kill him. And he triumphed over it by coming back to life. And uh, that's what we want to celebrate today, the new life that we have in Jesus. Uh, not just after we die, but right now that Jesus wants to convert our imagination of what is possible that there is a greater power than violence or force and that is love let's go to the table this morning jesus we want to thank you so much for how much you love us and the way that you have stooped so low to meet us you've not waited for us to come to you to get it all figured out that you've met us right where we are we can see this idea of incarnation in jesus and then begin to notice that perhaps you've been doing that through scripture all along in a sort of limited way, that we've begun to see this idea of incarnation long before you came along, Jesus, and you came 
as the apex of that, that we would have you not as words on a page, but as a human living among us. Thank you that we get to see exactly what you're like in noticing how you live uh, a life like ours. As we go to the communion table today, we're reminded of that and we're reminded uh, that you have laid down your life uh, for us and have called us to do the same for others. And so we go to the table pledging our allegiance to your way of love, Jesus, and asking for you uh, to breathe that way into us more, that we can't do it all on our own, that we need your help uh, to convert our imaginations, to uh, convert our allegiances, and to help us to become people of love. Uh, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, let's go to communion here this morning, and then I'll come back with some announcements.
Oh, that's great, Billy. Thanks so much uh, for that. have a couple announcements for you here as uh, we wrap up. Uh, first of all, if you want to give and donate financially to the Pathways Church community, uh, you can do that by going to our website at findpathways.com slash donate. There is a way to text to give, but it's easiest if you're online here uh, to go to our website to donate. And wow, we would really appreciate it. Uh, if you would do that, we know that there are quite a few of you that are here online and you participate online and are able to connect here. And uh, if any of the stuff, the content that we're putting out here is meaningful to you, uh, it'd mean a lot to us to help offset the cost of these things. If you would donate and uh, help us out that way, we would really, really appreciate it. Uh, also, uh, coming up next week, um, whoops, that's the wrong one. It's hard running all this stuff together. Uh, next week, we are going to be going to a baseball game. The Everett Aqua Sox is our minor league affiliate of the Seattle Mariners, and uh, we are going to go to a game at 4 p.m. Billy's going to be singing the national anthem, and we're just going to have a fun time out. It's supposed to be much cooler next week, so that should be much more pleasant than if we were going uh, today, so we're thankful for that. Uh, I have got tickets, so if you want them, you need to message me and let me know how many tickets that you need, all right? And the best way to do that is uh, my email here at the bottom on the screen here. Uh, you can message us on Facebook and let us know how many tickets you would like, or you can email me. My email is on the screen there as well. While you're at it, if you haven't signed up for our email newsletter, that would be a good thing to do. You can sign up for our email newsletter and get information about the things that are happening in the Pathways Church community. Okay, uh, that's pretty much it for this week. There'll be a lot more things coming up later. Uh, hopefully you survive the last remaining bit of heat that's out there today. I believe tomorrow temperature is supposed to drop back into what we would consider normal in the Pacific Northwest. We might even get a little bit of rain this week. Here, look at me playing weather, man. Love it. Uh, I can't wait to get back to some normal temperatures. So hopefully you stay cool enough today. Uh, and we will meet with you next week and uh, hopefully it'll be a cooler time as we do. Okay, have a great week. We'll talk to you next time. Bye.